I get started, I, I just want to clarify, really what I'm going to be talking about today is primarily the pneumoconioses. Um, occupational lung diseases is a much bigger umbrella, and it does include some lung diseases that um, I'm not going to cover today. For example, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which can be associated with a whole host of occupations, and then work-related asthma. Um, so I just, before I get started, I do want to remind you that anytime you see a patient in clinic who has new or worsening respiratory symptoms, make sure to take a good occupational and exposure history because oftentimes the culprit will be um, some new inhalational exposure. Before I get into the three big pneumoconioses, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the mechanics that determine why particulate matter causes lung disease. So one concept that's important is the accumulation of particulate matter in the lungs. And this depends on two different processes with differing rates. The first is the rate of deposition of the particles into the lungs. Um, and then the second rate, which counters that, is the rate at which the lung clears those particles. So deposition is governed primarily by particle size and geometry. That larger particles, larger than 10 microns, for example, are typically filtered out by the nasopharynx and the larger airways, and they never really make it to the lung parenchyma. The caveat being, and this is important for asbestosis, is that if you have um, a fibrous particle that is long but thin, like for example, asbestosis where you might have fibers as long as 200 microns, but their diameter is just a few microns, those can reach the um, alveoli and the lung, um, the lung parenchyma and cause lung diseases. Um, the other this other rate that's important is the clearance rate, and there are two important processes involved in clearance of particulate matter from the lungs. The first is something you guys may, may remember from physiology, the mucociliary escalator. So that is this, the cilia that line the respiratory alveoli, or the respiratory epithelium in the airways have this gel-like layer of mucus on top, and much of the particulate matter that we inhale gets trapped in that gel. And those cilia kind of beat upwards to the pharynx, and then we eventually cough the stuff out. That's important for the larger particulate matter. The smaller matter that gets into the alveoli themselves are typically dealt with by the alveolar macrophages, which phagocytose it and, and process it. And here there's a, a, lot, a lot of importance placed on how bioreactive we say the particulate matter is. So you'll see, for example, coal dust is actually fairly inert and doesn't cause the same reaction in the lung that, for example, silica or asbestos does that can lead to fibrosis and scarring. So with that sort of introduction, I'm going to focus now on the three main pneumoconiosis that we, that we think about, silicosis, coal workers pneumoconiosis, and asbestosis. So silicosis, just to begin with, this is a picture of um, the hawk's nest tunnel which is um, a tunnel through the Gauley Mountain. I don't know if you guys have ever been to the Gauley River in West Virginia. It's not too far um, from here. They actually, once a year, they have um, a base jumping competition from this bridge that's like 900 feet off the, uh, the river where you can go and you can watch people, you know, base jump with parachutes from the bridge. But back in the early 1930s, they were building a hydroelectric dam. And to do that, they had to build a tunnel through the mountain. And there were 5,000 workers involved in the construction, much of which was boring through the rock in the mountain. Um, and shortly afterwards, there was recognized a, an increased incidence in lung disease in the workers and uh, over 700 deaths ultimately attributed to it. This was one of the first large scale um, occupational disasters with a clearly respiratory um, exposure. And as a result, there was a, a slate of legislation passed later in the 1930s um, compensating workers and also putting in place future protection for work workers. Um, and as a result of that and subsequent legislation, we have thankfully seen a significant reduction in the number of deaths attributable to silicosis. Um, but there still is a low level exposure and um, and you'll see there's, there's some newer industries less associated with some of the heavy industries that we think about that have been on the decline and up their own. So example, there are much fewer miners in the United States than there were in the early 20th century. And that has driven this trend as much as some of the regulation. Um, but there are some, some newer exposures to think about when you're taking an occupational history. <clears throat> 
that we'll go over. Just to give you a sense geographically of where this disease, you may see more of it, uh, Appalachia and then in the Western states where mining are still, is still a pretty big industry. So silica, it's silica dioxide, basically sand. It's the most abundant material on earth and it exists in two forms. One is an amorphous form, which is really kind of the detritus of decayed dinosaurs and prehistoric material. That form is not toxic, um, but the crystalline form um, is, the, is the silica, the form that when it is hailed can lead to a whole host of pulmonary diseases. So silica is the, it's the most common mineral in quartz, which is a large component of pretty common rocks like granite, slate, sandstone, um, much of the earth's crust really. So any occupation that disturbs the earth's crust um, can put workers at risk for silicosis. Um, so many of these we've talked about and are somewhat intuitive, uh, you know, crushing, grinding, masonry, heavy construction, um, coal mining where they're, you know, working um, seams of coal in the, in the stone. Um, but there are some occupations that are a little bit less intuitive. Um, sandblasting, for an example, um, which is not always like a heavy industry. In fact, one of the more recent outbreaks of silicosis was in sandblasters in Greece. And they were actually textile workers in the denim industry who were sandblasting denim to give it a distressed finish. Um, without wearing appropriate respiratory protection, like you see this individual here. Um, another less intuitive um, occupational exposure is people who work in foundries, like steel, metal, ore type foundries. And the reason is, so here they're, um, they're pouring molten ore into these molds to create, you know, all different types of mechanical parts. Um, but these molds are lined with sand or silica so that when the, the ore cools, they can be released freely. Um, and that is an, a, the potential exposure in this type of work. Um, one of the more recent reported exposures is among dental technicians. So in the early 2000s, um, there were nine confirmed cases of silicosis, um, particularly in, in workers who were sort of sandblasting or refining implants and molds. Um, and this was across multiple states. And then finally, this is an important exposure um, wherever you live is um, people who work in construction who spend time installing quartz countertops in kitchens or bathrooms. This is a, a well-recognized exposure. And then you know, less common in this area, but certainly important in areas along the East Coast are um, people who work in the, the fracking industry. So the, the disease, that silica causes it has to do with, again, the, the reaction it causes in the alveolar macrophages that are trying to deal with it, its deposition in the lungs. And um, it activates them in a way that releases a cascade of cytokines that are implicated in fibrosis. In fact, some of these like TGF beta are implicated in other forms of fibrotic lung disease, such as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and this, this leads to several distinct um, presentations or types of disease, which really depends on the level and acuity of exposure. So high level exposures, like for example, the sandblasters um, in Greece who weren't wearing any respiratory protection at all, they tend to develop a fairly rapid onset of symptoms, respiratory symptoms, but also some constitutional symptoms like weight loss and fatigue um, that develop typically within weeks to, to years of exposure. Um, accelerated and chronic are sort of on a spectrum, which depends again on the level of exposure and the duration. With lower level exposures having a longer latency period and um, sort of a milder symptomatic presentation. And in fact, a good number of patients with chronic silicosis related to low level exposure over many years may even be asymptomatic and just have abnormalities found on chest x-ray. Um, the higher the level of exposure, the greater risk of developing what's called progressive massive fibrosis. And I'll show you some examples of this. This is really what is kind of the devastating lung disease that really impairs lung function and functional um, status. So chronic silicosis is some, sometimes called simple silicosis. And what you see in the lungs under a microscope are these little um, nodules which are um, basically collagen, hyal hyalinized or well-organized collagen. 
um, that you can see sort of staining pink here, typically occurring around the airways. And you may see um, these sort of brown smudgy cells are the um, macrophages that are full of um, typically like coal laden dust and are, they look a little dark for that reason. On imaging, like on x-ray, for example, you would see these little tiny nodules, particularly in the upper lobes. Um, and you can see that better on CAT scan here on this axial cut that you see really, we call it micronodular disease, and it typically is in a perilymphatic distribution. So you see it sort of along the blood vessels and airways, you would see it along the fissures. Um, in more um, um, extensive disease, it kind of coalesces typically towards the hilum. One thing that is on the radiographic differential of silicosis is sarcoidosis. So if you see someone who has a, an x-ray or CAT scan that the radiologist says looks like sarcoidosis, always ask about silica exposure as well. The other thing you can see is some enlarged lymph nodes or lymphadenopathy in the chest. And there's a very classic pattern of calcification, this eggshell calcification that you can see that's associated with silicosis. And in patients with this presentation, um, PFTs may be normal, and they may have many uh, minimal, if any, symptoms. What you can see under the microscope, um, in addition to these nodules, is if you look under birefringent um, or under uh, polarized light microscopy, you see these birefringent silicate crystals. And this can be um, diagnostic, although, as we'll discuss later, lung biopsy is rarely needed to make this diagnosis. This is an example of the progressive massive fibrosis that we talked about, where these nodules, this sort of this collagen fibrotic material coalesces, particularly around the hilum. And you can imagine how that might cause some obstructive lung disease, um, which is a common finding on PFTs. Again, it's typically more upper and middle lung zones. Um, and, and even this has some similarities to a patient with sarcoidosis. Sometimes in patients with progressive massive fibrosis, you can see cavitation. Um, but this can be tricky because oftentimes these patients have cigarette smoking histories, and so cavita new cavities could also be malignancy. And then as we'll talk about, um, silicosis puts people at risk for um, mycobacterial infections, in tuber including tuberculosis. So you always need to have a low threshold of suspicion for um, TB, if you see a patient that you've been following with silicosis who develops a new cavity. Acute silicosis, again, this is sort of a different beast. This is, again, the high-level exposure that occurs all at once. And in these patients, rather than those nodules that develop over decades, what you typically see is um, these ground glass opacities, otherwise known as silico silicoprotonosis. And under the microscope, it can actually look a lot like another lung disease called pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, that you see this pink um, material that's, it stains pink with um, PAS stain, um, sort of protonaceous material in the lungs. Um, and that's what leads to the symptoms. So again, you know, the, the diagnosis typically res, um, rests predominantly on consistent imaging and a consistent history. There's not a huge variety of the patterns of imaging, um, and the history is usually pretty overt or pretty obvious, um, unlike asbestos, which can sometimes be more occult. Uh, rarely a biopsy is required, and the main differential radiographically, again, would be sarcoidosis. Going to talk a little bit now about some associated conditions, just to keep in mind. Um, the first is tuberculosis, which I touched on briefly. Um, so there is, by some accounts, an up to 30-fold higher uh, rate of active TB among patients with silicosis. And it actually seems like silica exposure alone, in independent of um, actual lung disease caused by silicosis, um, is, a risk, um, is a risk factor. Smoking seems to uh, provide additional risk, and uh, what's less clear is whether or not there's also an increased risk of fungal infections. And this seems to be due to just general macrophage dysfunction um, as a result of the exposure. So again, you should suspect TB if you have a patient with silicosis that you've been following who develops new constitutional symptoms or even newer worsening respiratory symptoms and changes particularly more cavitation um, on, on x-ray. Uh, 
Um, people who have a history of silicosis uh, should be screened. This is uh, an old recommendation. Nowadays, we'd probably do an IGRA uh, or a, you know, a, a lab test to screen for tuberculosis. Um, and at one time, it was thought that because of the macrophage dysfunction and the parenchymal lung disease, that a longer duration of treatment was necessary for patients with TB and silicosis, although that is not any longer felt to be the case. There is also possibly some association between silicosis and some connective tissue diseases. Um, most notably scleroderma, this comes from a, a British Isles study, but also um, with ANCA positivity with or without the actual manifestation of vasculitis. And then also with some forms of renal disease. Um, it, silica is uh, established carcinogen in terms of um, uh, lung cancer risk. Um, although it, there are certain confounders that make it hard to really quantify the attributable risk, and it's not necessarily linear in terms of its relationship with the degree of exposure. So there are no, there are unfortunately no proven therapies um, for silicosis. Um, for people who present with the acute form of disease, that's kind of like the pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, which is sometimes treated with something called whole lung lavage, which is what it sounds like, which is actually um, liters and liters of saline lavaging the lungs. Um, some, some people have tried steroids as well for the acute form with, with variable antidotic success. Um, it's important to remember in um, primary care to screen for latent tuberculosis um, and to have a high index of suspicion for active tuberculosis with new respiratory or constitutional symptoms. Um, and then just, uh, you know, supplemental oxygen, vaccines, pulmonary rehab, kind of our, our basic supportive measures. Um, and then finally, referral for lung transplant, although um, small series have suggested poorer long-term survival than in recipients who receive a lung transplant for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So I'm gonna shift gears now to co-workers pneumoconiosis, and a lot of this will sound familiar. I'll tell you that the general, um, thing to remember about co-workers pneumoconiosis is that the coal itself is actually more inert and the lung disease that develops in co-workers pneumoconiosis is these nodules similar to silicosis that probably is related to concomitant silica exposure. Um, so it is specific to coal mining, but again, these are people who are, you know, disturbing the earth's crust, mining through quartz, these common stones. And so a lot of their attributable disease is actually from the silica exposure. Um, and this is very geographically centered in Appalachia. So three quarters of all active mines in the United States are in three states, and that's West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. Um, and unlike, um, you know, just mining in general, the number of coal miners, at least until about a decade ago, had been um, slowly rising from a nadir in the late 1990s. And in part possibly related to that, but maybe other factors, we are actually seeing an increase in the prevalence of coal workers pneumoconiosis since the late 1990s. And the trend has been somewhat alarming um, and the reasons are not entirely clear, but one association that is clear is that many of these cases are coming from smaller mines that employ less than um, 50 miners. Um, one of the other hypotheses is that, you know, a lot of the coal um, that was easier to mine because it was closer to the surface or sort of softer rock has already been mined. And so now the, the coal mining that is occurring is really requires more actually mining through the rocks that, that um, put people at risk for lung disease. Um, and as a result, there have been updated regulations as recently as 2014. Um, so coal, coal workers are required to, um, to carry exposure monitors or new exposure limiters. Um, and there's very close analysis of these trends by, um, by NIOSH. Um, there is actually a, a very well-developed surveillance program. So in areas of Appalachia where there's a lot of coal mining, there are these mobile units with x-ray machines and spirometers um, that screen coal workers 
um, and there are um, um, agencies that have been created specifically for um, the administration of, of um, these benefits. There are a couple of other um, occupations that are uh, placed if workers at risk that are not coal mining, just to keep in mind, the coal trimming, this is really an old one that, you know, this is people who worked on um, boats that were powered by coal and would actually feed the boiler. This is not really as relevant as it was maybe in the early uh, 20th century. Um, but electro, like in electrodes, for example, typically have carbon tip that, and there's some carbon fabrication. Um, and there's a pigment called carbon black too that's used to um, make tires black. Um, and people who work in these industries may have some degree of exposure. So what you can see in lungs that have been exposed to inhalational coal dust is what's called a coal macule. And this is when it's really just mainly the inert coal that they're exposed to. This is by definition something that is not palpable. Um, and it's usually a very small pigmented lesion that you might see on microscopy. Um, you can see some dust-laden macrophages like you did in the silicosis, particularly around the respiratory bronchioles. With increasing exposure to silica, you see some of these nodules like you saw in silicosis, these sort of hyalinized collagenous nodules. Um, surrounded by some of these macrophages that are hard to see here, but those are typically like the smudgy brown cells. And they, like in silicosis, in the more severe forms, can coalesce around the hilum to cause progressive massive fibrosis. The difference being grossly, and I, I think I might have a slide, but grossly this lung will look black. Um, it looks really awful. Uh, this is an example of a chest x-ray. Um, this person you can see on the x-ray has a cavity. You see the air fluid level here. Um, and this is the gross specimen. So again, this, this black pigment is indicative of the coal uh, pigment exposure. So like with silicosis, the risk increases with the intensity and the duration of exposure. Um, but it also increases with um, something called coal rank, which has to do with its carbon content. Um, so the higher the coal rank, the more likely, uh, likely it is to cause lung disease. And then finally, it has to do with the degree of concomitant silica exposure, which is the more bioreactive of the per particles. And then finally, like we talked about, there is this association, although it's not exactly clear why, of um, working in underground, underground, but in the smaller mines. And again, so this is specifically the trend regarding progressive massive fibrosis, which is the most devastating form of disease. These are people who are typically quite disabled from their lung disease. They need supplemental oxygen. They're you know, likely to die young um, or need a lung transplant. And you can see that the trend really has taken off since the early 2000s, um, particularly in Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia. There, are, there is also some autoimmune associations with coworkers pneumoconiosis that are distinct from silicosis. There's something called Kaplan syndrome, which is the finding of um, pulmonary nodules and, and RF positivity. Um, and, uh, you know, for a while it wasn't clear whether it was the coal exposure that was a trigger for RA, but now it looks like that probably that um, RA is a host marker for those who are predisposed to develop lung disease um, in the presence of the exposure. Um, and then this is a little bit of a confusing graph, but basically what we're looking at, so there's something called the ILO reading. Um, so these are, it's a specially trained um, radiology reading that pulmonologists and, and radiologists can, can um, apply for after some self-study, um, which is quantifying the degree of abnormalities on the chest X-ray, primarily for compensation and surveillance programs. Um, but what this is demonstrating is that even sort of very minimal radiographic um, abnormalities, um, even with those minimal um, abnormalities, that you do see um, abnormal spirometric values and that there does seem to be an association with the degree of chest x-ray abnormality and the um, spirometric abnormality. Uh, 
the management is really identical to um, to silicosis, although it doesn't seem like there is that increased risk of lung cancer. Um, although there is a signal that there may be, interestingly, an increased risk of gastric cancer uh, with co-workers pneumoconiosis. Um, but other, you know, it's it's also a, you know mostly a clinical and radiographic diagnosis based on history and imaging. Um, as with silicosis, you have to maintain the same level of suspicion for tuberculosis and should screen for latent tuberculosis. Um, and then supportive care with tobacco cessation, supplemental oxygen, lung transplant referral, pulmonary rehab. Um, and then making sure that your patient um, is, is hooked up with one of these programs um, that provides benefits. So finally, asbestosis. Um, asbestosis is a, um, a fibrous heat resistant material that's been used going back to antiquity for, um, for um, thermal insulation. And its use really increased exponentially um, between the um, First and Second World Wars in the United States. Uh, used for things like pipe insulation, roof shingles, ceiling tile. Um, but the, the ill health effects, which were first recognized kind of in the 1970s and 80s, um, have led to, again, legislation um, that has limited its production at this point and its use in construction. And since 2012, over 50 countries worldwide have either banned or severely restricted the use of uh, asbestosis because of the health effects. There are multiple different types of asbestos fibers, um, but the ones that are really important um, in terms of causing lung disease are these amphibole or crocodilite fibers. And you can kind of imagine why, I mean, this goes back to what we talked about in terms of deposition and the aspect ratio is that you have these fibers that, although they're very long and longer than, you know, certainly a spherical object of this diameter wouldn't get into the lungs, um, because it's very thin, it can get all the way down into the parenchyma and is a setup to cause disease. Um, and, and you can contrast that to these serpentine fibers. This is a, a form of the um, material that actually is not really uh, associated with lung disease. And these springy fibers are more likely to get caught up in the airways and in the escala um, mucociliar escalator and more readily cleared by the lung. And that's, that's probably why we don't see disease associated with it. So again, asbestosis, like the other diseases we've talked about, it is typically a clinical and radiographic diagnosis. But uh, if your patient did have a lung biopsy, what you might see are these asbestos fibers, which get coated in iron and, and they get this sort of rusty, reddy, reddish brown coloring. Um, they're known as ferruginous bodies. This would be the sort of the hallmark finding that suggests the exposure. There are three different types of disease that we think about um, being associated with asbestos. The first is the fibrotic interstitial lung disease that we call asbestosis. The second is pleural disease. This is pleural plaques, which are often calcified and pleural effusions. And then finally, malignancy, um, which we'll talk about. Um, mesothelioma is the big one, but also increased risk of lung cancer. So unlike co-workers pneumoconiosis, uh, deaths related to asbestos, asbestosis um, have been on the decline, and this trend has continued. And again, this is the result of two things. Number one, you know, around the 1970s is when a lot of the ill health effects were first recognized, and in that following decade is when a lot of uh, regulation limiting the use of asbestos took place. Much of the disease that we see from asbestos exposure has a latency period of at least a couple decades. And that's why it really took till to the 2000s for us to see the peak and then, um, and then the, the decline in lung disease associated with asbestosis. Uh, this gives you a sense of geographically where, where in the US we see the most disease. Um, and again, it had been used for a while in insulation um, nowadays, it's still used in brake pads. Um, this would be sort of thermal insulating material production. This would be like a glove like those iron ore workers would wear. And then for decades, really associated with um, military exposures, particularly naval yards and shipbuilding. 
Um, in addition to a lot of what we've talked about, about the fiber um, um, geometry, um, asbestos fibers tend to be more bio-persistent. Um, and the fact that they spend so much time in the parenchyma is, um, is part of why they cause such a degree of disease. Um, but there are other um, factors like the solubility of the material and its electrical charge, which, um, which are implicated in its ability to cause the disease. Like we mentioned, there is a latency period of, of um, decades for the fibrotic interstitial lung disease. So the disease really doesn't show up for 20 to 30 years after. And um, so this is important when you're taking a history to remember that really you're asking not necessarily what your patient has done recently, but what they did maybe when they were a teenager or in their 20s. Um, the effusion is, uh, shows up sooner. It's typically within 10 to 20 years of exposure. And the symptoms depend on what presentation we're talking about. The effusion, sometimes people will have some chest pain or discomfort um, that's pleuritic. Sometimes they're asymptomatic. Um, with the fibrotic lung disease, they'll often present similar to other forms of interstitial lung disease with sort of an insidious onset of cough or shortness of breath. They may have um, um, crackles on exam and clubbing. And their PFTs are typically restrictive, like with other forms of pulmonary fibrosis, with the reduced diffusing capacity. You guys I hopefully have seen at some point um, these calcified lung plaques related to asbestosis. I'll show you some x-rays, but this is what they look like grossly. Um, they typically occur around the diaphragm, and um, they're sometimes referred to as um, a candle wax stripping appearance. Um, this sort of whitish plaque. Again, typically see them um, just over the diaphragm. You can see them around the pericardium, typically between the sixth and the ninth ribs, so the lower parts of the lung field, and typically sparing the costophrenic angles and, um, and the apices. This is what they look like on a CAT scan. So here you have the rib here, but then you can see this um, pleural surface here that's calcified, um, as well as here. Again, they're often bilateral. You may also see associated with the pleural disease something called rounded atelectasis, and this could make you worried potentially for a malignancy because it can be a, a look like a nodule, but one of the differences it has, we call it the comet tail appearance, the swirl of blood vessels and airways towards the hilum. And what it is is, is chronic pleural inflammation sort of causes the lung to wrap around itself um, and form this, this nodule of lung parenchyma. The effusions that we see are typically on the small to moderate side. And again, patients may be asymptomatic. If they are symptomatic, they may have some chest pain or some shortness of breath. Um, there's often a concern for malignancy. They're typically unilateral, and the patient will often, often have multiple thoris and TCs to check cytology. Um, it's sometimes described as a hemorrhagic exudate, um, and sometimes you can see some eosinophilia with it. Um, but they do typically resolve over months um, without really intervention, and they can leave in their wake some pleural thickening. But it is a diagnosis of exclusion, and it, it's not uncommon for a patient with this presentation to undergo more invasive diagnostics like a VATS, for example, to inspect the pleura and make sure there's no malignancy. What you see under the microscope, it's actually a lot of what you would see in, for example, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis with this asbestosis, the interstitial lung disease. So it's typically more pleural disease. You see a lot of collagen deposition or scarring in the interstitium. Um, the difference and what sort of clues you in about the asbestos is the, um, these ferruginous bodies. But again, this is, you can't even really tell that this is a, a lung. I mean, you don't really see any of the nice air spaces out or alveoli. You just see this sort of pink collagen in the interstitium. And then on, on x-ray, you see typically, again, like in IPF in the lower lobes, you see this fibrosis, this kind of shaggy appearance of the um, diaphragm and the mediastinum. And then on CAT scan, you see uh, the hallmarks of fibrosis. So this peripheral reticulation, this is just peripheral fibrosis. That's that collagen that you would see under the biopsy. 
And then at the bases, you can sometimes see honeycombing, which is really just end-stage fibrosis in the lungs. There's a lot of similarities between um, what you would see in asbestosis and what you would see in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Sometimes if you can see those pleural plaques that are calcified, it can clue you in to the exposure history, even if the patient doesn't recall the exposure. Um, and then, you know, other things on your differential besides idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis would be um, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and um, um, pulmonary fibrosis related to autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Um, there is, there's no specific treatment, although um, an intentinib, which is a um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor with sort of multiple targets, um, is now approved for use in all types of chronic um, progressive fibrosis lung diseases. So you could potentially prescribe this for asbestosis um, in a hopes to slow the progression of the disease. It doesn't stop the fibrosis and it certainly doesn't reverse the fibrosis, but it may have a, a modest impact on the trajectory or the rate of decline of lung function. In general, asbestosis is not as relentlessly progressive as um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, but it certainly can lead to chronic respiratory failure and, and death and um, need for lung transplantation. And, um, you know, other than that, the, the care is really supportive, like we've talked about, you know, making sure your patient's vaccinated, has supplemental oxygen if they need it, have stopped smoking, um, pulmonary rehab. So finally, malignancy, the third um, part of the Venn diagram. Um, first, lung cancer. So asbestosis is, um, although we think about it being associated with mesothelioma, it's actually an important risk factor for the development of lung cancer. Um, and particularly if your patient has combined exposures of cigarette smoking and asbestos exposure, that the, um, that the risk factors are actually multiplicative um, of each individually, um, so up to 60-fold. Malignant mesothelioma is uh, really a devastating um, thoracic malignancy, and asbestosis is really the only known risk factor. Um, and it can develop in patients with transient or even uh, indirect exposure. The classic example is from the old days um, when women were the ones doing laundry. Um, you know, the, the husband who worked at the shift yard and, and would bring his clothes home and, and, and the wife would get it years later. Um, it, it typically has a long latency period, um, and it's often, you know, very um, extensive by the time patients have symptoms like chest pain or shortness of breath. Um, treatment is often palliative, and, and palliative treatment involves uh, multimodal therapy that includes sometimes radiation, uh, chemotherapy, and um, a really um, morbid surgery called an extrapleural pneumonectomy. Um, so it has a, a very poor prognosis. Uh, one question that comes up often um, is people who are concerned about their asbestos exposure, wh whether they, you know, they worked in a, um, or they, they, you know, went to school in a place where there are asbestos tiles in the building or, you know, worked in an office with asbestos containing materials. Um, and really, the, the lifetime um, risk for premature cancer death due to these types of exposures is very, very low. I mean, certainly if you had um, tiles that were breaking down or construction that was going on, nowadays any construction where asbestos is removed is done with, um, with very specific precautions to prevent exposures, but um, um, these sort of remote exposures have a much uh, lower likelihood even of um, causing cancer as the current um, permissible exposure limit proposed by OSHA, which is 2,000 per million cases. Um, so for the most part, you can reassure your patients that there's not a, a really a significant risk for those types of exposures at all. <laughs>